and welcome back to beautiful Adelaide to the the uh, studio of RI Oz. I am the director of RI Oz. My name is Paul Willis, and it's my pleasure to be your host for this discussion this afternoon. Would you please welcome my panel here tonight? <laughs> this afternoon. I, I want to start with a little story that really only occurred to me while I was uh, watching Martin present uh, a, a little while ago, uh, to try and get across the, the idea of disruption, digital disruption. Uh, personally, I've found it a little difficult to come to terms with until I put it in context with my background as a paleontologist. I, I don't know if you know, but apparently Martin is also a budding paleontologist. We both love fossils. And in the fossil record, there's been this enigma, this thing that's taken a long time to figure out, called the Cambrian Explosion, where suddenly, in the Cambrian period, about 530-odd million years ago, give or take a couple of days, suddenly, everything appears in the fossil record. All the major groups of creatures are suddenly there with hard shells that turn into fossils. Prior to that, well, they were probably around, but they didn't have hard shells, and so we don't see the fossils. So that's this Cambridge, the idea of a Cambrian explosion. And the explanation, most plausible explanation that's been put forward is that it's at that time that we see the first animals capable of sight. So predators, for the very first time, could see their prey at a distance. They didn't have to bump into them and then realise that they were worth eating. And that triggered this incredible arms race all of the other creatures had to develop armour to protect themselves from these predators that could come and eat them. And because that armour was hard-shelled, it turns up in the fossil record. That little arms race that went on from the simple introduction of light is what we call a Cambrian explosion. And that transfers directly to the example of digital disruption. Uh, so, Martin, if I've got it right, what we're saying is that for business... If you're looking at the new digital environment uh, and online environment, as look, you'll get by with just a new website and, and uh, improved email, you're not up with the game. You don't understand the change of environment that's going on around you. Thanks for throwing that to me. That's a great <laughs> one. <laughs> Let me wrap my head around that. Uh, yeah, there's, I, I think you're right. I think that... There's a, there's a phrase in evolutionary biology called punctuated equilibrium, which you'll be very familiar with. And the idea is things are the same for a very long time, and then there's this massive amount of, of change which is, which is caused by something here, a meteorite hit the ground when all the dinosaurs die, whatever. Um, and, and when you were talking to me about that, I, I actually saw that analogy for the first time, which was great. And you're right. So it's like we're another explosion. It's this... And what I talked about, these confluence of technologies, whether it's wearables, whether it's cloud, mobile, social, or digital, that they are all pervasive. I think part of our message is, and that you talked about um, the evolution of eyes uh, in terms of then creatures didn't have to bump into each other. They could see their prey. Is that being important? I, I think for us that something that basic is, is those websites, it's those digital technologies. Um, so I think we are saying, well, you bl bloody need a pair of eyes. It would just make sense, right? But that is... That, that is, that's the entry point. What must you get right? So it's almost like the eyes are the things that you must get right. But, uh, and then some of these other digital technologies, things that will allow you to not just defend against yourself, but actually to be more successful. So some of these are sort of defensive mechanisms. Uh, when, a, when a new technology is introduced, often uh, to start with its competitive advantage. So in the first period of my career, helping companies deal with the web was for competitive advantage. And then you get this period of well, everybody has it, so you're playing catch-up, and then it becomes, it's no longer a competitive advantage, um, and it's, it's, in fact, it's base infrastructure for a business. So, for instance, having a, a website, uh, just like, whereas when only one creature had a pair of eyes, he could attack everybody else, and it was competitive advantage. When everybody's got eyes, that's not enough. So I think what we're saying is that your base um, web presence is the equivalent of eyes. It is that, that um, sort of, today, it's base technology, and it's things like mobile, social, digital, and those other things that become that are still a competitive competitive advantage for companies. It, it's triggered a complete game changing environment. Uh, uh, Jane and Richard, uh, mm. you both work in companies that have confronted digital disruption. Can I just one by one go through your experiences, Jane? 
how did you confront digital disruption? How did you embrace the online and digital world around you? <clears throat> I guess for my company, we've always been a service provider, so it's not so much Brabham, it's more the clients that come to us. So for us, I've seen the shift, as Martin said, people would come and ask for web. We want a website, we want something online. Now, um, clearly that's, that's a given and it's not good enough just to have that. The shift that I see now is personalisation, so more than ever before, it's the expectations of um, the individual out there, the individual client, customer, whatever it might be, is um, they are the ones driving the clients that are coming to us, that the client is coming to us and saying, we need to do something, we know we need to do something now, we need to do something about personalisation, our clients are no longer happy with the way that we interact with them, the way that we our messaging to Mary and Fred needs to be tailored, needs to be specific and different, and if it's not, we know we're going to lose them. So the, the digital disruption is not so much for Brabham, but more for our clients. And um, in, a, in a very, very large um, way that I've never seen it before, it's about incredible personalisation that when a client comes and logs on, you must know exactly about who I am to you as a business, you must know about my transactions, you must know about my interactions with other people in your business, otherwise I'm walking and I'm, I'm moving to somewhere else. So do, you, do you have to explain that to your clients or are they aware that that's the problem? <laughs> Good question. Um, depends, uh, and people that know me know that I work in different states in Australia, uh, and I, it's, it's probably timely that I'm in South Australia at the moment, because I would say if I'm in one of the eastern states, the clients are coming asking, begging and pleading, get us, get us to the point where um, you know, we have that interaction and our clients know exactly how we work with them. In South Australia, sometimes it's the opposite that we're advising them, that we're saying to a client, look, this is not actually enough for you. You need to think about uh, you know, the transactions, you need to think about the services that you're offering to your end client, and, and, and we have to guide them and mould them and shape them and get them to understand their return on investment, because it costs, and it costs not only in, in um, dollars, but also in a change of culture within the organisation. Um, Sometimes there's a little bit of pushing from our side to get them to that point, but if we don't push, we know that at the end of the day, um, they're probably not going to be in business in the next 12 months. Richard, your experience is with uh, digital disruption, but uh, with a, f a focus on the idea, it's not just an evolution into the digital space, is it? It's, it's far more involved than that. Yeah, I suppose. <coughs> um, digital disruption started for me in 1982 when I bought a Commodore 64. And uh, if any of you are that old, you'll remember the Commodore 64. And I was running a hotel, and uh, it, uh, I realised that it was on Sunday nights, it was taking me four hours to do the wages. I had a maths teacher who drank in the front bar at the Victor Harbour High School, and he could do code, so he sat me down as I could type. And we both wrote out this program, this wages program, and I was absolutely fascinated that it could actually do the wages for me and also work out the coins and the dollars that I needed from the bank. So that started me. And I sort of became a bit of a, every, everything I do, I, I have to, it has to have a computer, it has to do this, it has to be able to do that. So that's where I started. And then as I started building the business, I started buying other hotels. And then I started watching the young kids and the way they were moving from different hotels and what was it about them that they required. Because the kids of today uh, are that quick, they, they, they'll sort of staying in one area and looking at one thing, one minute next, they're off, what's the next adventure? So I started looking at data. So we started looking at the data of these, of these kids back in the late 80s and un try to understand what their drink was, what that was. And that's when I first found out about the smart card technology that was, that was in Europe. And there was a company in Europe called, uh, in France called Gemplus from a, from a town called Geminos. And they'd released this smart card and it was about a chip that could store the data on a card which absolutely fascinated me. Unfortunately, it was twenty dollars a card, and no one, no one would get involved in that until we finally got the price down to about eight dollars. But then, the data that we started getting off these cards that they were carrying around with them was just amazing. It was fantastic, and that's what sort of got me involved uh, in that side of it. And I think you know what we were doing a long time ago was very difficult because I used to go out and sell it. I used to go out and sell the technology uh, to bring on other retailers, but. They, they just, for some unknown reason, they didn't understand the power of the data back then. 
as what they do today. And you are based <coughs> here in South Australia. Yes. What's the state experience for digital disruption? We heard earlier that uh, we seem to be a bit behind the eight ball here. Yes, we are. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, a few years ago I approached uh, a group, a very large supermarket group, and I explained the technology of the, of the data, how it would work, what the Lordy system, how that would work, the interaction not only with petrol stations but with other retailers in the shopping centre. After doing the presentation for an hour and a half, I both, my partner and I both sat down and the person in charge said, he said, look, it's all well and good. He said, I like that idea. He said, but I've got one problem. And I said, what's that? He said, it'll work. And I said, what's the problem if it'll work? He said, it'll cost me money. So the, the idea back then was, I want Lordy, but I don't want to pay for it. In other words, you walk into a shop, if there's a 10% discount, they'll turn it around if you're prepared to pay full price. So they're not thinking ahead. Mm. If I look at today, I'm a chairman of a, of a um, bottle shop group, and I've finally got them over the line with online shopping and collect online. So I finally have got them to agree we're going to go online and how we're going to do it differently than Dan's. I believe at the moment there's a million people buying liquor online. 500,000 of them are with Dan's. So we've got, we're coming from behind here because retailers, when I first started talking about loyalty and data and data analytics years ago, I got the thing, well, if Woolworths and Coles aren't doing it, why would we do it? And I said, well, there's your opportunity. Get in now. And it's like, it's like now, with due respect to Woolworths and Coles, they are buying data an analytic companies, but they're not giving that data feedback back to the suppliers. So hello, the door's open for us. Mm -hmm. We'll get that information and we'll give them back to suppliers. And as a result of that, what's happening is, is that we're now doing deals with suppliers that they will give our consumers prizes or presents, whatever, without going via the dance of this world who control what happens. So we're going to cut that middleman out and go straight to the consumer via the phone, by your phone apps, but not necessarily phone apps. No one's downloading phone apps. It's all push notifications. Like, if I walk into through, and you've all probably heard of it, iBeacon technology, it'll pick me up within 20 centimetres no matter where I am. So if I go into a shopping centre or I go into a supermarket and I'm walking down lane six, it'll, it'll go, beep, Richard, in lane seven, last time you bought Gillette Blades, Schick will offer you $5 off that price and there's your barcode, bang. Now, I didn't have to download the app, I didn't have to do anything. And that's <coughs> taking, that, what that really excites me about is it's taking away that ability to Woolworths and Coles and the big nationals to control brands because we can control brands through this. We're getting the consumer to take control of the brands. And that's through that digital technology. Is this, Martin, what you mean when you use the term experience, which I've seen you mm. use in the past? I, well, when I talk about experience, is that I, I gave a, a lecture recently to some uni students, and it was about the role of the CIO and what that is. And I, I said I, that I think that the, that the successful CIOs in the future were those that focus on the experience that they give the people in the company, traditionally, there's a lot of focus, which is what I call below the line activity, which is on the technology and on the operations, keeping it running. But if you look at the iPhone, is that everything that was available on the iPhone was available prior on another device. Compaq made them, a few manufacturers made them, but the difference is, is that I used to wear them on my belt. There's a few guys, <laughs> there's a few smiles in the room. You used to wear those smartphones on your belt, right? And it came with a, a manual this big that actually I would read every page and learn every feature because I was a techo. But most people, right, the average punter in the street picks it up and says, that is too complex a piece of technology. The technology is getting in the way of itself. And what Apple did was focus on the experience. And they yeah. took the technology out of the way and said, and then the smartphone could be successful because of the experience that they give. And if their marketing um, also focuses around this. So when they um, launched the, the, you know, the iPod, the music player, there were lots of I, you know, MP3 players mm -hmm. in the market, and they all sold by how many gigabytes of storage it had, right? And what Apple said was things like your entire music collection in your pocket, right? It's what is the experience that I'm getting from it. So when I talk about the experience, those companies that will win and be successful is around how do I improve the experience? And actually, one of the um, case studies about H20, Jonathan, who's got this sort of modern plumbing business, it's a small business, but he is focused on the experience because he's got a a cloud-based technology setup that allows him from end to end to do quoting 
and billing. And so he can go out and he can quote you on the spot and it can be emailed and he can get paid and everything happens seamlessly. So the experience for somebody is much better. Whereas I just had my roof fixed and the guy came out, you know, took a week and a half to get back to me, sent me a Word document that I said, well, you shouldn't really send me a Word document. I can type and change the price. And I can PDF it and tell... Did like, you? you know, no, of course I can. <laughs> I, I paid the extortionate bill, so I didn't have a leaky roof. But um, so I, I think that companies that focus on the experience that their users get, which is enhanced by technology, not technology getting the way, I think they're the companies that will be successful. Mm. And Jane, in discussions prior to this event, uh, you made the comment that you'd rather lose your wallet than your phone. Mm. Really yeah, <laughs> can you just explain that a little further? It, it made me think, and, and I've never done it before, and hopefully I'll never do it again. But um, yeah, it, it was a scenario where I had both wallet and phone, and for some silly reason I left my phone somewhere, and luckily it was retrievable. But the immediate thought was, I need every, everything that I need is on my phone. Nothing that I need is in my wallet, really. I can get by without my wallet. And I did think back to like probably 10, 15 years ago, if I'd lost my wallet or if any of us had lost our wallets, it was catastrophic. It was about credit cards and all that kind of stuff. The minute that I thought my phone was gone, it was like, oh, no, okay, what do I need to do? Um, and I know there's backup and all that kind of stuff, but the immediate um, pain of, of not having a phone for someone like me, and I have seven email accounts that I'm checking on my phone pretty much day, well, more than seven. daily at the moment, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's another issue in itself. But, um, but it was more about the... I've got one. Yeah, yeah. You don't need my ego, you need a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it, I'm getting them down. But it was more about the transactional value that happens on my phone as well. So the things that I can do on my phone, and I know that, um, you know, I've been talking with another entity and, and the, the, the likes of Martin will know this, that the wallet will actually be gone very soon. Within the next year or so, I won't have a wallet with credit cards. I will only have my phone. It will be my phone that will determine how I pay for things, when I pay for things, what I pay for, um, how the transactions all happen will be on my phone. So uh, I don't know how the rest of the people in the room feel. It would be interesting to see what would you prefer to lose, your wallet or your phone? It depends how much cash you've got in your wallet. But for me, um, it was an a awakening again about the change, the change of what digital has done. Because, yeah, 10, 15 years ago, the wallet was the thing you didn't want to lose. Now, a lot of uh, businesses that have uh, tuned in for today's discussion, uh, many of them would still be relying on traditional purchasing methods and stock management, etc., 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 which would all be confronted by the digital disruption. Mm. So what's your advice, any of you, for companies like that? Well, first of all, should they really think about getting yeah. off their butts and getting involved? Absolutely. They have to. If, yeah. if they don't, they're gone. They're, and it's, and it's so the time what front. do they do? Well, they have to, like it's, it's stock taking in, in companies, how they can stock take quickly. Uh, it's, it's how they can run their business if they don't. They're going to fall behind. There's businesses yep. leapfrogging. The technology is racing at the moment. And I'm if you're sitting there thinking that it's, oh, we'll wait, we'll wait, don't wait, because it's, 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 yeah. it's well ahead than what you already think it is. So my, I'll give you a very practical example of a small business. So the, my barber that trims my beard and cuts my hair, right? So it's just him in his shop, right? And he's got nobody else because that's the way he likes it. His brothers also have shops. They use the same brand, three shops, different shops, three brothers. Maybe they don't get on. Uh, and I was, I was talking to him you know, while he was cutting my hair last week, um, about the launch of this, and he was going, ah, oh, digital disruption, it won't help me, I don't understand it. And I said, right, okay. And I looked over and he had a really old till, right? It's a really old one. And I said, wow, wouldn't it be nice to have a newer till? And he said, oh, yeah, but they're $3,000, and the man's always coming in to try and sell me one, but I don't want to spend $3,000. So I said, have you heard of Vend? He said, no. And so Vend is a cloud-based point of sale system, and all he would need to do is get an iPad, and a commodity $250 till, plug it in, and he could now have a modern touch screen, and it's based in the cloud, right? And not only that, his iPad is connected, and he can use the free wireless around town, so he's got dual redundant links, so he's all modern, right? What, who, how could he do that? And not only that, Vend plugs in to Xero, which is an accounting platform. So I said, how long do you spend at the weekend, and he said, oh, about four hours on a Sunday afternoon adding up his receipts and getting... And I said, well, that would all happen by magic, right? Because Vend would talk to um, Zero, and it would automatically post that, and suddenly you would get those four hours back on your Sunday afternoon. You could spend it on, ooh, marketing or something, 
working on your Facebook because there's not many posts on there, those kind of things. And that's a very practical, not only that, he, he, so he would avoid the $2,000, $3,000 cost of, from the, the old fashioned point of sale till because what they've done is that they have linked in the software with the hardware, made it proprietary and sucked you into keeping that. What Vend have done is they've separated the software from the hardware, say so go and buy the, whatever, soft, whatever hardware you like, make it commodity, I can put it on an iPad and they focus on the quality of the software and it's cloud based. So it doesn't, he actually just, he just rents it. So he rents same it. With, same with supermarkets. Yeah. Um, we provide the software for over 1,400 supermarkets. Point of sale hardware will basically be finished in about four to five years. It will be the iPad and it will be in the cloud. Our biggest, uh, I suppose, support and maintenance is on servers. People getting under their servers, doing other things, the disruption there. So it, it will go to the cloud. And we're talking to supermarkets now, that's what they have to do. So the cost of hardware, and the cost of being in the cloud compared to what they've currently got, they're miles ahead to do that. But it's also the flexibility. And so if I use Vend, right, if I've got this old fashioned till that sits here, it, there's this physicality to it that I have to be in front of that till to know what it's doing. Or if it's a server in my organisation that's connected to my, I have to be there, I have to find some way of connecting securely into it. If it's, if it's cloud based, I can shut the shop at the end of the day and go home, get a glass of wine if I'm that way inclined, and I can then log in to um, vend and I can see what I've received throughout the day and do that in the comfort of my home on my iPad at home. So it gives flexibility. So just think about um, the ability for these, like the H2O company, to go out and actually be quoting on the spot. It's, it, they're not having to go back uh, and, and fill out some template that they've created in, in Word. Not wishing to overplay it, but let me just run out the, the techno-skeptic, the, the neo-Luddite who would say, look, over the last 20 years, we've had computers, we have to replace the computers every three years because of the software upgrades and what, yada, 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 and we've all got online and developed websites so everyone knows who we are online. Are you just asking us to move up a notch on that treadmill of new technology being rolled out and why? Is, is it really going to be that advantageous? Look, so this is the way I see it, right? So you talked about the eyes, right? And so when creatures first formed eyes, you go, what are these new fangled eyes? I don't need those, right? And then they were gobbled up by a creature that could see them, right? So I'm saying, do you have to go out and do something? No, you don't. But the thing is, right, is that the way these technologies work is they work in a curve, and it's called the curve of innovation diffusion. At one end, right, which is the very early adopters, the, 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 the current wisdom says if you, can, if you get a technology out there and you get about 16% of your target market buying it, then you reach the tipping point, and we've heard that phrase, and that means that probably most other people are going to get it. And then what happens is that the competitive advantage is got in the early days and on the up swoop, and then on the down swoop is you're playing catch up. So if you don't do those things, you can't be, um, you can't be um, competitive. So here's an example. I haven't always been in technology, my very, and I'm quite old, my very first job, I was an industrial engineer and I was newly qualified and they got me to do a business case for a fax machine. This, people are laughing, right? Why is that funny? But it is funny, right? But I had to do a business case for a fax machine because it was 25,000 pounds. And they go, why are we gonna buy this new fandangled thing that squirts paper out, right? What is it? Why do we need to do it? Well, the fact is, the company I was working for, TRW, built switches, uh, and they wanted to win some accounts with some of the big guys, like Ford or Jaguar. And Ford or Jaguar expected that you had a fax machine, or they didn't really want to do business with you. So they didn't want to send you a letter, because that was so old-fashioned. They wanted to send you a fax, so you could get the order and confirm the order by return fax. So we, we got a business case through, and, and, and we bought a £25,000 fax machine. Now, we laugh at that today, but there was a time where it was a very expensive technology, it was competitive advantage. And sooner or later, any company that, never, that always refused never to even get a fax machine won't be here today. So what, what I think our message, or what, what my message is, is that sooner or later, if you do not adopt some of these technologies, your customers will expect it, yeah. 
and the experience that you're giving them no. is not as good as your competitors and people will choose, the consumer will choose what product or service manufacturer gives and, them the best experience. And there's no Pyrrhic victory for that, uh, that company in saying, well, <laughs> see, I told you fax machines would go out of date sooner or later. And, uh, exactly right. <laughs> it, it, it'd be out of date It's irrelevant. Then. That's it's, taking long-term you know planning to it, it's add absurdum. Early, these things are competitive advantage, and at some point they become you, you know, <laughs> base infrastructure for a company. Like the technology, having a website is base infrastructure for a company. But it's at one, one time, it was, ooh, what is that newfangled thing? We are going to open up now to questions from the audience or online. If you're following online, uh, please type your question into the chat roll at the bottom of your screen and we'll get it to you. Uh, we have a question over here. Uh, so, uh, Hamilton, would you mind taking the microphone over to here? And if you just hold for a moment, sir, we will get a camera on you so that everyone following the live stream knows that uh, there is a voice. And are you ready there? OK, your questions, please, sir. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Rick Carney from Business SA. Um, a question that often bobs up with new technology is how secure is it? Security. <laughs> more, more se well, if yeah. we talk about the cloud, um, mm. and I think these guys will agree with me, more secure than what you could ever afford to have in your own mm. business. Without a doubt, um, I've been doing cloud for 10 years or more, and um, it, it, it does show you, because those questions have stopped being asked by, our, by clients that will come to us, we would get, how secure and where is my data? That's a five year ago kind of question now. Now it's more, what does it do? When can I have it? Um, you know, what can I integrate it with? Who can I share it with? So the security questions, for our business anyway, we don't get them from, from um, clients anymore, but yeah, by far you could never afford the, the um, security that is in the good cloud products and the reason for that is because that is their business. If they fail, their share price goes down and they're out of business. Um, so for them it's paramount that the security is there and but, we've seen that. But wasn't it only last week that the celebrities were saying that if you want to get nude photographs of yourself on the internet, you store them securely on the uh, on the cloud and let someone hack into it. Yeah, but it's, so that's human. So it's the human interaction that will undo anything that is on the cloud. The same as we've seen when um, employees in businesses have taken data, they've taken um, you know confidential information and they've walked. It's it's I, I don't know yeah. what the stats I, I, are, but I'd have to say it'd have to be yeah. nine times well more than that, ninety yeah. times out of a hundred that it, it's the human interaction that will that will yeah. undo a cloud. But also, uh, there, there's a couple of comments that I'll make about that. Firstly, that was a consumer sort of product and they're typically less secure than business grade. Um, like Dropbox was driven mostly by consumers and that is I can store you know, storage in the cloud. Dropbox was famously hacked. What do you think they did? Well, they, they plugged that vulnerability and moved on, right? Um, and it, the systems become more and more secure, certainly as they get publicised. Um, the other thing is that I, we do a lot of work with Salesforce and I would get that question, how secure is Salesforce? So I went to Salesforce and say, and said, how much did you spend last, and this was 2013, how much did you spend last year on security? And they said, well, we can't tell you exactly, but it's, it's probably about $100 million. So you show me which South Australian company has spent $100 million on security. You know? I mean, if you're a small business, you've got probably one, or, uh, one IT guy with a few, you know, a few guys that are, that are very good, but are they up with the latest vulnerabilities, the latest attack types, the, you know, the technology is proliferating out of control and you need to be a large corporation that's dedicated and organised to protect against that. And most small to medium companies can't. So the fact is they are having their core systems in the cloud with reputable cloud providers, yeah. they are probably safer than storing it on their own equipment. We have another question uh, over here. Uh, we'll just get a camera on you and please. Your question, uh, sir. Apologies in advance for a slightly complex question. Uh, Patrick Canny from Corvest Limited. Uh, disruption is the what happens. I'm interested in how it happens, and especially uh, new ways of starting business models like minimum viable pro product, products and those sorts of things. Have you got any tips for businesses in how to get started, how to make what seems like an insurmountable journey easier by making it uh, you know, smaller steps, incremental stuff? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll field that first, yeah, is that we are, we are very um, clear with our clients is that what they need to do is get closer and understand their customers, their own customers, whoever they are. Um, because it's only understanding the wants, needs and pain points of your customers 
um, understanding what their requirements are, how they become influenced about the products and services. Once you understand them, you, you'll be much more likely to know where to invest in what kind of technologies. Um, and that is something that can be done. We prefer an ethnographic approach, which is really where it's sort of ethnographic workshop types, smaller numbers of people. It can be done very cheaply, but you get really great insights into your customers, how they think, how they feel, uh, and how they make decisions about the products or services in your marketplace. And we say doing that first allows, takes a lot of the risk out of where to spend money. And the second thing that we say is that you need to experiment cheaply and learn to fail or succeed very quickly. And so, for instance, we'll give our clients this experiment, which is build a tower out of spaghetti and marshmallows, and this is a Stanford experiment. And if you give somebody 20 minutes to do that, um, you, most s sort of primary school kids will take the spaghetti and the, and, they will, and the spaghetti snaps in the marshmallow, but you think, well, the marshmallow, spaghetti is quite tough, but it's not. But what a lot of adults do is they do all the design first, and in the last two minutes they try to build a thing, and then they, 80% of adults don't actually even build a structure, whereas 80% of primary school kids at least build some kind of structure. And so we use that as an example to show the importance um, of experimentation, and that is you spend lots of time planning. This is around make some small investments and do an experiment. Try Facebook, right? Just try it, see if it works. If that doesn't work, that doesn't mean Facebook doesn't work. It means try something different, try a different voice, try a different. So for us, experimentation is very important. As much as, well. as I hate the phrase, it sounds very much like democratization of business. Mm. Uh, that instead of one size fits all or one or two mm. pathways by which to do things, that it's very much tailored to the individual. Mm. That's what we talked about earlier, and I think to, to answer as well, it's that minimum viable product is that if you have that relationship with your customers, clients, um, I've always found that to release the minimum, they'll be forgiving. If, if you're honest and transparent and you release um, you know, the minimum that you can actually do, but it's good and it works, they're much more forgiving. And I know that even I'm like that with Zero, for instance, the accounting package. It didn't do everything that I needed, but it was so good and it, it gave me such a good user experience. I forgave them for, for not having an end-to-end -end completeness. And I've seen that they've, um, they've added on features and functions. So if you can build that relationship and have that, that um, um, experience for the client, the customer, then you can release a minimum viable product and, and build on it. They'll be forgiving if it's not 100% there because they know that you're working on it. So that's, uh, and I'm living proof of that, I guess. Mm. I think the other thing too is keep it simple because um, your developers can take over and develop something that just goes past what the consumer is yeah. looking for and they don't relate to it. And uh, we've learned that in the past. So we try to keep it simple. And then with the, in relation to upgrades, then start doing your three monthly upgrades so you can bring them up to it. Otherwise, if you think, oh, no, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this, the, the consumer's down here and you're jumping up here. And then you don't get that connect. And that's what's really important to start you off is that connect. All right, we have a question, and I believe this question's actually come in from the live stream. Is that right? Yep, Paul, we've got one. So Sylvia Estrada on the chat roll asked the panel, how can agribusiness companies, such as Murray Goulburn, take advantage of big data and associated technologies? Mm. What, what was the question? <laughs> That's a very good question. Who was data? Who was agribusiness. Yeah. How can agribusiness take advantage yeah. of uh, big data and digital disruption? That's a great mm. question, isn't it? Yeah. Out of my it, league, it'd have to be suppliers, the, the supply yeah. chain, I would think. You're not going to do yourself <laughs> out of a contract here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so First of all, is that, so we've done some work historically for, for Rural Bank and we, we looked at that, um, that sector uh, and, and what we found was that um, agribusinesses typically see themselves as not particularly digitally sophisticated but they actually are. Um, and particularly about this instance, if it's big, and big data is a great question, right, because Big data is really about let's just grab everything and see if it tells us something. Uh, something. something. Mm -hmm. And there's some good technologies um, called SOM or self-organising maps which you basically uh, chuck a whole bunch of data at it and what it does is it finds correlations between things that you didn't know. And so for me it would prob probably be that either in the supply chain, in the middle of the supply chain I would have thought that's where I would start looking. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I, I mean it would be worth, you know, looking at the entire um, value chain, I would have thought, as well. 
All right, we have another question. Uh, it's down the front here. Yeah. Uh, hang on, we'll just make sure we've got a microphone on you. I mean, a camera on you. Okay, your question, please. Sir. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to uh, go back to the experience thing that you're saying, building on experience is important. And I wanted to test my hypothesis that I've been observing this, not only just experience, but I think the care that um, businesses are giving to the consumer, that's also quite, an, quite a big thing. What I mean by that, for example, I paid Jonathan by PayPal, quite a large sum by PayPal to your plumber. And next, in, within two hours, PayPal calls me from US saying that, are you sure you wanted to pay this guy $4,000? Are you sure you could receive the um, uh, services in return <coughs> and all that thing? I've never seen bank checking for that. And that, to me, increases their social currency up there. And I would blindly use PayPal for everything and anything. So is that observation correct? I mean, nowadays, car industry is also going to the care factor. Um, smaller business that you forgive them for not having future. I noticed one of my wife's business um, is physiotherapy and is a Queenslander who developed cloud-based patient notes and this guy one-on-one, -on -one, he replies to emails 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. He just constantly <coughs> giving her a better thing and she forgives him for not having all the futures for things. So is that a right hypothesis? Is experience plus care or is it care just a social I, I think that care is something that we experience. So, um, so I, I think you're right. And that's why what we say is get close to your customers is, is to actually understand them. So I think that, I, I think that if we um, give people a great experience that they, that they believe that we care. And the other thing about that as well sometimes is um, a lot of companies care too much. Uh, Harvard Business Review wrote a really good article called Your Customers Don't Want to Talk to You. And the idea was that, that companies often put a greater uh, proportion of um, you know, a, a, around a relationship uh, than individuals do. So, for instance, Qantas, that I often fly Qantas, they have this disproportionate bombarding me with love stuff, and sometimes, sometimes I choose to, to fly Virgin. But I say, well, you're just an airline that just flies me around, and you care much more about my relationship because it's your business to you. Um, and, and so I think that sometimes it's the, the care is the don't get in my way of doing a transaction with you, but be there. So it's like when I walk into Bunnings, I don't actually like somebody saying, good morning, how are you? Because it feels they've been told to do that. It's not very authentic. But if I'm looking around and I can't find the tool I want and I catch somebody's eye and they're straight there and can be very helpful, then that is authentic. So I think for me that, that there's this, this sense of authenticity that, that needs to go hand in hand with with caring as well. It's to do with customer culture as well, which we sort of look into what is the customer culture. Uh, as Martin said, it's not customer culture, not when you walk in the store and get, hey, how do you, can I help you, and I, and I get in your face. Uh, take the Uber taxi at the moment. Now, you look at that, and, and that's information, that's what I believe people want. Mm. If I ring a cab, and I've got to catch a <coughs> six o'clock flight, I'll probably ring it the night before, at about you know, quarter to five, I start thinking, I hope he's here, I hope he's here. Whereas, you know, I now will get a message, your cab is five minutes away, peace of mind, turn the lights off and I walk outside. So that's what we're looking for. It's also, if you buy anything on the internet from America, the first thing they'll do, we've packed this and it's on its way. It took take five days to deliver. That's the sort of thing, that's the information that we look for. That gives us the security because, you know, People still think it's a risk buying things over the web, as you say, with your money, and are we ever going to get it? And I think those things give you that sort of security. But it is about information. The more information, when I say the more information, the relative information that we can give you. It's like if I know you like a Shiraz, I'm not going to bombard you with bourbon or things like that, but when the vintage comes up, the two, 2012 vintage comes up, you're on my email list to tell you to come into one of my hotels and try it. And every time I send you a message, ah, that's my Shiraz again. It's not it's my bourbon or... Exactly yeah, right. So I'm... And that's what the data does. But yeah. the more I can talk to you about what you're interested in, the more you're going to talk back to me. What about taking this to the other extreme? Isn't this playing into the hands of Big Brother, too much big data out there? I mean, how much information about ourselves are we prepared to give away? Yeah, I find quite a lot. I think if, it, if it's a if it's a win-win scenario and, and that example that I don't need to be bombarded about bourbon if I'm into Shiraz or whatever it is. And again, it's that trust, it's that empathy, it's the um, 
it, it's, it's uh, a more of an equal kind of balance of, of information that if I share something with you, then you'll share something back with me that is relevant to me. Um, then most people are quite willing to, to give if it means that they're going to get something back that is, has value yeah. to them. I think the yep. digital disruption is about what does that mean to the bottom line of businesses now and to mm. um, you know, the, the profit and loss, that the care factor, the personalisation, um, the, the whole way of dealing with people in a personalised way, at the end of the day when you have to stand up to shareholders and say, well, for us to do that and to be unique to this person and this person and this person, that cost to our business in the first instance can be overwhelming in both um, what you do with digital and what you do with uh, you know, how you interact and um, presenting a personalised interaction kind of messaging. It, it's hard as a CEO and a, a board to say, OK, I understand that we need to spend X number of dollars to get to that, that level. Uh, so digital disruption for me is not only about how and how it's communicated and um, you know how business performs business but it's also about what does it mean to the shift of the bottom line of the profit and loss and balance sheet yeah. sort of messaging as well but uh, mr jobs has given us the tools for that years and years ago right. and we didn't see it but That's now right. we're seeing it so yeah. samsung are giving us the tools so the tools are out there for us to use we just got to sit and look at how it works and and, and get there so it's not that's not hard we have another question here. Uh, we just we've got a camera on you. You're ready to go, sir. Okay, Mark Ogden from WorldSmart. I guess my question is around capability. Uh, we actually play in this space and deliver e-commerce platforms, data analytics platforms, etc., to our consumer base and customer base. One of the biggest challenges we have is actually getting the capability within this state. And I guess there's been a lot of talk in South Australia around the focus on manufacturing. There's been discussions within Australia about Google and Apple taking a lot of uh, profits offshore. We are an Apple reseller. We know the margins in that aren't significant. So we, as a, at the moment, are going through a fairly significant restructure as an organisation to bring the capabilities, especially from the developments. And what we're finding is that the skill sets either reside in Eastern Seaboard or internationally. So I guess my question is, how do you see the public and private sectors working together more so to create a real emphasis of this capability within this state? Or is it something where we're always going to have to facilitate the, the expertise in, in other markets? I, um, I, I'm with you there. But if you look in the room here, we've got Jane from Brab Brabham with really, you know, and, and I think it's sad in a way that Jane feels that she needs to spend time in Sydney to, to generate enough exciting work to, to stimulate herself. But I can see Jeff Rorschheim sitting down there who's built and sold and still has a couple of fantastic technology companies. So there are the capabilities here, but it's harder to find them. It is harder to find them. When I look for staff, it's very difficult to get them because the best, the pick of the bunch from Adelaide or Flinders, they really want to leave South Australia. And I think that's sad. Part of this, though, is saying there are still things that we can do. Um, and we can either sort of say, oh, it's all hard, or we can actually do something about it. So this report, from my perspective, is, is Deloitte Digital and the South Australian government saying, let's just start. Let's just start and take a step. And you're right. But I think that the, what you have to do in your own business is say, what do I need? What are the skills that I need? And where can I find them? And for your business to prosper for South Australia, find them where they are. And if they're not here, find them somewhere else. But please just bring that revenue back into South Australia. Yeah, bring the revenue. Bring the, yeah, bring bring the, the economic revenue. benefit back here. Yeah. Build your business to the stage where people want to come and work for you. Yeah. Just you know? for having a look around management teams, this, uh, this brave new world redefines the power structure in management. So who's more important these days, the CFO, the CEO, or the chief digital officer? This is me. I know you, I think. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think um, if you look at the, and I, I remember we, we spoke about this, the CFO versus the CDO, if we've got one, digital officer or CMO. Um, We're just working our way through the yeah, alphabet. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And, you know, years ago it was the CFO. The CFO would always become the CEO and the CFO held the money and the wallet and all that kind of stuff. I think now the shift is that the CFO, unless they are... Um, a very switched on digital kind of um, person in how they're thinking. They are looking at past figures. They are looking at the financials of yesterday, two weeks ago, two months ago, a year ago, and they're trying to predict the, the, the chief digital, chief marketing, whatever the terminology. They are the ones that are driving those figures, that are driving their revenue and driving the income. So if it was me, 
I would, I would be looking at the Chief Digital Officer for what, what is our company, um, what does our company look like in the next two weeks, what does it look like in the next two years, in the next two months, where is our revenue coming from, um, you know, give me the big data about where, where our revenue comes, what time of the day do we, do we sell, uh, who do we sell to, what else do they buy when they buy our product, that's all the kind of stuff that I'd want from digital, so personally I'd, I'd invest in a Chief Digital yeah. and my CFO, I know we need financials, but I think the, um, the forward-thinking businesses will focus on what, digital. What we've seen is, um, if I look at the role of the, the CIO, because mm. typically that's the traditional one that would cover digital, and I know that we get this chief marketing officer, chief digital officer, but if you look at the role of the CIO, it's four key roles that you need to think about. You need to think about operations, you need to think about technology, you need to think about um, strategy, and you need to think about innovation. Um, and strategy and innovation is what we call above the line thinking, and the technology and operations are below the line. Now, every business needs those four things, and what we've seen is the CIOs typically in Australia focus mostly on the bottom, uh, the bottom of that, the below the line thinking. So it's around the technology choices, it's around the operations. What the business needs, though, to succeed is the innovation and the strategy parts of it. And so what we've seen is that we've seen CIOs have, have come up alongside the seat that they used to be under. You know, like the original thinking when I was young and in technology, it was, well, computers are numbers, let's put them under the CFO, right? So you see the CIO, which doesn't actually make sense. CIO was, sort of got its own seat at the board, but now we're seeing a lot of CIOs move back under and I think the reason for that is because a lack of focus on the above the line thinking which is around strategy and innovation and I don't care who does it in an organisation but it should be somebody. Now often we find some really good CFOs know that they need that and they don't go to their CIO but they actually go to the market to find it or they're trying to do it themselves yeah. and that's not a bad thing. I think companies need to innovate um, to, to continue to grow or thrive or defend themselves but somebody needs to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a glimpse into the future as the world is now, uh, and this wouldn't be possible without the, wi the wisdom of my very distinguished panel. Would you please put your hands together for Martin, Jane, and Richard. Thank you. Thank you. And that wraps it for today's event, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we do look forward to seeing you all again in the very near future. Thank you very much. Thank you.